Hi, I'm Gary Byers, and this is Troweling Down, Biblical Archaeology for the 21st Century. And this is our resident rock star, Dr. Stephen Collins. And um, last time we were together in a different venue, but we were talking about um, the article, the scientific article that went out about the airburst event that happened at Tal al Hammam. And uh, we, we kind of discussed all of that. But there's, there's, a, there's a back story. There's an after story, a cause yeah, and there, effect story. There's a here. lot of after story. So, uh, so, so just set us, set us up a little bit. And we'll, if, if necessary, we'll even take a couple sessions to, to do all this because there's a lot to talk about. And we really think it's important stuff. So, so tell them a little bit about the after story. Well, of course, it was one of the most downloaded scientific papers in the history of scientific papers. <laughs> I mean, and, and uh, Nature Scientific Reports is a major, yeah. major journal. It was a peer-reviewed scientific paper with 21 authors, most of whom I do not know. Um, don't know what their religious background is or if they even have one. Have no idea about most of them. Now, I think there's three or, three or maybe four of them that I, that I know personally. A couple of them, couple of them I know pretty well. But the rest of them, I, some of, I was surprised to see some of the names on the paper uh, because I didn't even know that they were involved. So um, I, was not, uh, I was not a mover and shaker on the paper, even though I, when they were doing their research, I supplied to them what I knew, what I know, uh, regarding the archaeological side of the whole thing. Now, the physics side, the astrophysical side, the physics side of all of that, the science, the nanoscience, all of that, uh, all, all the, the, the micro uh, proxies and all that. Forget that. I mean, that, that's, that's out of my pay grade, right? But, um, but the archaeological side, of course, it's coming from an archaeological site. Because what were we testing? We were testing uh, a hypothesis that if Tal el Hammam was is biblical Sodom, or at least the the seedbed providing that Middle Bronze Age city providing the seedbed for the Sodom stories as they are found in the Bible and ultimately in, in the Quran, um, that there must have been some kind of event associated with it. Now the, the Bible says, there's, and the Quran says, there is an event associated with it. Fundamentally, it's fire and burning stones from out of the sky that destroyed the cities of the plain. That's the, uh, the tale as it's given in, in scriptures. So what are we to do with that? Well, there are some people who had put it in the south end of the Dead Sea, and we, think, we thought early on in the research that that wasn't going to work out uh, because Bible writers, just like ancient Near Eastern writers, Bible writers didn't make up fictitious geography. They were just re dealing with yeah. real locations, and there's a lot of geographical details on the location of Sodom, and all of that locates it north and east of the Dead Sea, not toward the south end of the Dead Sea. So we dismissed that southern end a long time ago, plus the fact that all the sites in the south uh, were destroyed hundreds and hundreds of years before Abraham was ever born. I mean, way back as early as 2500 BC. So that sort of, you know, the time and the place were just not right. So our research took us north and east of the Dead Sea. We found Tal Hammam. Giving, and, and of course, that was motivated by the idea from the language in scripture that Sodom was the biggest one. Yeah. It was the biggest one of the cities. Well, the biggest Bronze Age city in that location is Tal Hammam. I mean, it's bigger by several orders of magnitude, so it was kind of a no-brainer to identify that with the city of Sodom. But of course, then we had to excavate. The excavation then uh, took us through lots of good stuff. We, we, we have excavated through and published quite a bit on the Iron Age. Yeah. We've excavated through and published quite a bit on the, uh, the Middle Bronze Age. We have excavated and, and published quite a bit on the Intermediate Bronze Age and going back to the early Bronze Age. But of course, the biblical focus would be uh, for Genesis 10 in the early Bronze Age and Intermediate Bronze Age and for Genesis um, from later, 13 and following through 19, it would be the Middle Bronze Age, the time of Abraham. So um, our, our hypothesis was that, uh, that if Sodom was located at Tal al Hammam, and if as the phenomenological description in Genesis 19 implies, there was a fiery cat catastrophe from out of the heavens that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain, that 
there would be, if that were true, would there be proxies or, or physical indicators of an event of that magnitude? Now, you, uh, you, and you started your research as far back as the middle 90s on this, and we started excavating in 2005. Um, you, you, would, you decided, based on the Bible, and then based on, on archaeological evidence, geographical evidence, all kinds of things, other historical evidence, that that was the right site, but then we needed to excavate. That was, that was the hypothesis. We needed to excavate. And at some point in, in this process, and remind me, when did you get the air burst concept? Now, the Bible says fire and yeah. brimstone from heaven, yeah. but where did you come, where in the process, what timeline did, did you get this air burst thing in your head? Well, um, Professor John Moore put me on to the language of Genesis 19 as a phenomenological description of an air burst. And he went on to explain how that's the only thing it can be. What else would it be? You have an event coming out of the sky. What would that be? And airburst research, and this was way back in the late 90s. Late 90s. Uh, airburst research was just then sort of mm -hmm. ginning up yeah. and getting going amongst the scientific community. And so um, I, we suspected way back then, and we actually published uh, on it in 2004 four or five, somewhere in there. Yeah, even before we started to dig? Yes. That was actually yeah, we, part of the hypothesis. Yeah, we wrote the paper up. In fact, become multiple chapters, and John Moore and I uh, co-wrote a chapter on airburst events as a possible explanation of the phenomenological language in Genesis 19. So we were thinking of it back then. In fact, I'd never heard the word airburst before John introduced me to that. And then I got into the research of people like uh, Boslo and Tunguska and... Uh, Western Egypt, uh, Egyptian desert, all uh, airbursts that are classic and, and where people have gone and studied what the proxies are, what the, what the effect is on the ground, what the aftermath looks like physically. And so if we had an event, now we knew we had a great destruction. Yeah. There is so much ash, particularly on the lower city. We, there was one place where we dug through three meters of it. It just went, it just went, where there's a swale on the, on the lower city, it just, meters and meters of ash. But also on the upper city in the palace area where we've been excavating, we have a meter to a meter and a half of just broken bricks and pottery and, and lots of charred material and uh, even melted materials. And uh, it's, it's a quite stunning looking yeah. uh, debris field. And um, there we also sent some directionality to it. Yeah. And that was kind of moving in a particular direction, in this case to the northeast. And so um, what are we going to do? I mean, the hypothesis is, part of it is, if this is biblical Sodom, is there any evidence in the destruction layer of the Middle Bronze II uh, terminal destruction layer? Because uh, the, the, the overall occupation pretty much ends there for the mm -hmm. next 700 years. Mm -hmm. And so... What's in, is there anything in that thick destruction matrix that would indicate something like an airburst? And, and of course, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't, I, don't, no, no, I don't know how to answer that question other than to go to experts who deal with this kind of thing all the time, who understand what the proxies are, what little nano micro particles uh, what kind of effects are produced to, uh, uh, to, to signal that such an event actually took place? So uh, we, we, we were there, and, and I was not involved in any of this initial research with you. I was digging where you and I first had met in, over on the other side of the river at right. Kirbet Omakata, where we uncovered, where we discovered a, a destruction layer right. at what we think is the biblical city of Ai. So we... We, um, we, we, we done this, but I was not involved in all this research, and he just invited me to join him when he started this dig in 2005. And uh, we're looking for, I all thought, all I was thinking was a destruction layer. Could we find a destruction well, layer? I, and, and that's what I was thinking going in, you know, a good, a good thick destruction layer would say, would say a lot. Yes. I mean, yes. it was just, there it, it is, the city was destroyed, nobody lived there for the next 700 years, that would have been enough. But it was not enough. And, and by the way, that's where most people would lay it. 
Most archaeologists would look at it and say, yep, yep, we've got a big, ugly destruction layer here, and there you go. But wait a minute. What about the nature of the destruction? Is there anything in the destruction matrix ex itself that would tell us what the catastrophe was? Was it an earthquake? Was it a volcano? Was it an enemy what? army? Was it was yeah. it an army with explosives? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but um, so you have to test. I mean, not to test it at that point, especially in the light of the Genesis 19 yes. hypothesis or that component of the hypothesis, um, it'd be irresponsible not to test it. So I threw it first off to uh, a gentleman uh, uh, who's a top leading expert. I won't use his name right here. Um, but uh, he turned me down flat. This is way back in like 2007. He turned me down flat, put me over on M.A. Cordy, and she didn't really want to do much to it. She's in Europe. But then we have this other group, finally, about five, five or six years after that, way down, more than that, maybe 10 years down the road, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, they came along and said, hey, we've seen some of your ma uh, melt materials, seen some of this burn material. We'd like to analyze it. We'd like to come in and take, take samples. We'd like to come in and do a scientific analysis of your destruction layer for the Middle Bronze Age and determine uh, possibly what it was. Well, what they began, as they began to collect samples, churn through the material, look at the melted surfaces of pottery, look at things like melted mud bricks like this. You can see the bubbles of it all bubbled up. Mud bricks and, uh, don't have bubbles. Mud bricks don't have bubbles because they're not fired. Yeah. And this was like, you can see the, this is melting. And um, so we have, by the way, th this material, we have lots of it from your, one of your yeah. squares. I mean, it just, you know, we have buckets of it sitting around in the in our storage mm -hmm. in Jordan. But um, this stuff is pretty amazing. But you can see it's mud brick. It even has the little, the little pieces of straw, yeah. you know, in the mix there. And um, so this is really interesting stuff. But it's melted. Now, this could have melted. This, could have, this particular piece could have melted in just a really intense normal fire. But we found other pieces. And, of course, it did start a fire. An yeah. airburst event yeah. lasts how long? About that long, yeah. maybe a couple seconds afterward, yeah. and then it just blows everything apart and sets everything on fire. Well, in the smolder, you could create stuff like this. The problem is, this is found down in the mix, the matrix, not surrounded or touching any, any real ash or burned wood. In other words, it didn't melt in place. It's suspended with a lot of other junk and gunk in this, in this deep matrix. And so there's nothing around it that could have created it. It had to be burned somewhere else. In other words, it had to be blown off some of the location and landed there and melted prior to its landing, along with the hundreds of other pieces of it. And so um, that was just really interesting. Uh, but we did find pieces of pottery, the surfaces of which gave indicators of very high temperatures, 3,000 plus degrees centigrade. Uh, for, for, for certain um, yeah. elements or crystals to be melted and so on. And that's all in the paper, by the way. So read the paper, Nature, Scientific Reports, uh, tell Hamam Airburst, and, and you'll find it. But anyway, but I could just tell you to read it and you'd have fun with it. But the aftermath is what I really want to get into, and we'll let, we'll let this spill over into the yeah. next episode of Trowling Down. But what I want to just say, sort of in closing this segment, and sort of as a segue, I hate that word segue, into the next segment, uh, I will say um, there has been some controversy uh, generated where we are getting huge kickback from people of, of the, of the anti-Bible crowd who just can't stand the idea that there's any historicity in the Bible. They're kicking back and they're saying things that will ultimately become, I think, embarrassing to them because I will answer. And I'm working on answers to all these things. So let's let it go right there. We'll pick it up in the next episode. So you can wait a while for it, can't you? Uh, we're going to come back and talk about, in the next episode, all of these things that people are saying, uh, like uh, attri attacking us for doing pseudoscience and all, all kinds of stuff. We're going to come back and deal with it in the next episode. All right. So you, you heard it here first, or maybe you heard it somewhere else first. But this is a... This is a big deal. This is really important science. And, and, and this, is, this is Bible stuff. And 
um, when, when science and the Bible come together, people should be happy and excited and say, man, this is amazing. We're not getting that kind of response. So um, we're going to do our job to the best of our ability. And we've got, fortunately, a team of scientists who are working in conjunction with us. They're not our boys, but they're part of our team. Uh, they, they become part of our team. And, uh, and they're going to be doing their part. We're doing our part. And we expect to see, to show even more than what came out of that first article, because there's more to tell. But the response, the, 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 the aftermath controversy, the response, stay tuned with us for next time, and we'll get it all out there. Troweling down biblical archaeology for the 21st century. It's exciting, and it's not for sissies. I hope you'll be back with us.